welcome to this week's episode of the Inspired Evolution. This one is with Matt Coldrick, more affectionately known as Pan Electric, and it is such a treat, like such a treat. This one is purely for the heart. We are now, uh, I don't want to say sponsored, but we feature Pan Electric, Matt's music as a uh, yeah, as the intro and the outro to the Inspired Evolution. And it just felt really wholesome to get him on, get his insights. There's such a story behind the new theme music to the Inspired Evolution. Um, its roots being an Ethiopia song, like tribal songs about the earth. And just, yeah, it's such a beautiful prayer. When you tune into it, you're going to love it. I know you will. I love it. And it just spoke to me no end. So it was an opportunity to speak to Matt. And I literally feel like he's someone I could speak to no end, <laughs> like we could just keep talking and keep talking. But we tried to contain this conversation to the inspiration around music and what it means to him in his life. And dude, we go deep to the point of like even Pythagorean sort of philosophy and the ratios of music and how sound can be a healing, how it's a force for community, how it's a force for cohesion. And just, yeah, like how the fact that we were singing even before we were potentially speaking and just that level of technology, we do go to some pretty interesting places in terms of what it means like to be disenfranchised from singing because, you know, these days not everybody identifies as a singer. It's like those guys are good singers, so they sing. Um, and I don't sing. Some people have that sort of qualm. Um, what it means to be disenfranchised from your heart song. So a really robust conversation about music, sound healing, the potential of sound, song and music um, and the place that it holds in our lives and what it does for culture and how it brings together community and how fitting this song is now at the heart of our community. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you guys for tuning in. If at any point when that moment happens, I know there's going to be a moment in this conversation where you go, ah, gold, right? Touch wood. At that moment, feel free to give the videos a thumbs up. And uh, yeah, if you're new to the Inspired Evolution, please feel free to stay in touch and hit subscribe. We love having you around. Enjoy, guys. Welcome to the Inspired Evolution, and it is an audible treat to be here today. We have with us Matthew Coldrick. Matt, how are you, brother? I'm great, man. Thank you so much for inviting me onto your show. I'm really, really happy to be here. Are you freaking serious? Okay, so for those tuning in to the episode, you've just tuned into this episode and you might have noticed something new because you're probably regular listeners. Um, if you're listening for the first time, you've just tuned in to the new intro to the inspired evolution. And this music has come to us by way of Matt. Matt is a, has a pseudonym, <laughs> Matt by day and Matt by night. Which one are you? Are you Pan Electric by day and Matt by night? Or is it Matt by day uh, and Pan Electric by night? Time has no meaning to me. It's all the same thing. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, Sweet as Brain. Um, yeah, by Pan Electric. And it's the man's the and Matthew's the man behind it. And it's the new intro music to the Inspired Evolution. And I can't tell you how much of a beautiful journey it's been just connecting to you, Matt, through this song. Um, uh, I like what please. Yeah, it just the way like there's just the there's so much spirit in it. There is just so much spirit in it. And when I reached out to you, um, there was there was there was certain elements of complications <laughs> which weren't like us trying to get the song to stick it was like hey i really just want to share with you the story behind the song and as you mm. started sharing it with me i was like brother we've got to do a podcast on this like we have to really, yeah, yeah. really honor the energy of what's going on here so here we are um let's before we dive into all of the song and where it came from music tell us a little bit about how music came into your life have you always been musical has it always been a part of your prayer producing or is it something that's come through yeah. recently tell us more man Ah uh, no no um, goodness me so uh, critical moments going on holiday at the age of seven to the island of Mallorca in the Balearic Islands and hearing on the jukebox uh, "Give Me Love" by George Harrison and being transfixed by it um, to the point at which I spent the whole of the holiday going around the bar begging for peseta coins from the locals and from the hotel guests 
and uh, loading it into the jukebox and playing the song over and over again to the point at which it became an embarrassment for my, my family. Um, <laughs> they took that as a cue. They saw that as a cue and they bought me a guitar, a Spanish guitar. Oh. So at the age of seven, my, uh, my journey had begun. And I, 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 I must honour the, the life the work and the spirit of George Harrison because he really started my engagement. It wasn't the song, it was the halo of energy around the song and the man himself that I was drawn to. You don't know that at the time, but that's, um, it's played out because uh, a year and a half, two years ago, I started uh, touring with uh, mantra artist John Levy Harrison mm. and um, no relation to George Harrison, uh, mm. a wonderful coincidence, but um, we sang three of George Harrison's songs in the set that we did at different times. And a lot of our dialogue, artist to artist, uh, was about what George Harrison brought to the West because he was a cultural mm. bridge and a spiritual bridge between Eastern uh, spiritual philosophy and the Western world in the 1960s. Now, he wasn't the mm. first, but he was a very significant uh, Let's call him a spiritual ambassador. I think mm. that's kind of the role that he that he performed. And so, me being drawn to his music uh, in the Balearic Islands was was no accident. You know, it was um, the gateway to a process of learning in time and through my personal experiences in life that music is uh, a phenomenal uh, river that carries spiritual energy between individuals mm. and communities and environments and when we open ourselves up to tap tap into the source of that river then uh, our lives can change beautifully mm. and it's amazing isn't it thank you so much for sharing that and uh the, one of the things i love so much about music is that, like the timeless quality of it as well Absolutely. you know like you know george bless, bless his cotton socks <laughs> may have passed on but the frequency lives on do you know what i mean for the prayers and the message and the energy to be connected to and it's mm. it's really remarkable like i know this is a bit out there but if you were to like think about that from like paleolithic terms to have someone's like voice like prayers music frequency captured to live on it's almost black magic -y. <laughs> do you know what i mean like it's it's well, always like <laughs> George Harrison was the mystic, the natural mystic out of the Beatles. And what you're describing is the boundary between our scientific understanding uh, of what time is. And really, it's a, it's a false construct, because the minute you abstract any sense of time from, from nature, the rhythms of nature, it becomes meaningless or it becomes a tool of, uh, I don't think it's too strong to say that it's, it becomes a tool of power and control. Now, that, that's mm -hmm. not conspiratorial. It's just simply the fact that we start to define rhythms for people's existence outside of natural rhythms um, mm -hmm. or maybe slightly beyond them. And to understand that music, and I'll quote a French philosopher whose name escapes me. I think it was Jean-Claude Levy. It's Levy, his name was. I can't remember the, his first name. Music both describes and destroys time. Um, maybe I can look up the quote for you and get it back to you so that we can insert it later into the show. In the show notes, um, yeah, I could do it in the show notes. Yeah, <laughs> so um, what does that mean? This is something I discovered for myself, and then when I saw this quote, which was given to me by a, a, a Greek musician uh, uh, last year in Santorini, um, uh, a very mystical man, or, or a man uh, concerned with mystical things, and, and mm. through, the, through the, the story of ancient Greek music, he's a, a lyra player, uh, like the lyre, and um, what it did was it confirms to me that part of the magic of music, part of its power, is its ability to simultaneously entrain us to rhythm so that we can become its definition of time and therefore to break us from any false constructs of time. When we engage in, in a, a musical pattern, it does a number of things on, on a number of levels. Um, melody will enchant us into a world uh, that disrupts conventional grand narratives and gives us an opportunity to tap into our, our inner narratives which are very mm. important um it's it's rhythmic power gives us a pulse through which we can re-engage both with our own uh, sense of, of rhythmic power the heartbeat mm. the power of the breath 
uh, the connectivity of both in defining us as separate from the world and of course of, as, as totally engaged with the world. Hmm. Um, it creates an opportunity to, to rediscover that boundary and to work with that boundary. And, and then a really interesting one, uh, which is harmony, which is less of a concern in, in Eastern, Eastern traditions uh, and much more of a concern in West, Western traditions. And harmony has the opportunity as a concept to teach us about relationship because mm. harmony is the definition of how one note relates to another and mm. how one note can relate to several others and how several others relate to each other. And so it describes by creating uh, an, an emotional context in sound, you know, a minor chord sounds sad, a major chord sounds happy. It's a, a simplistic example. Mm. And then there are many nuances in between that. The major sevenths and uh, the minor sixths start to create these very well-defined descriptions of emotional uh, character, personality, tone. So harmony describes relationship and the emotional experience of relationship. So, so we have this complete uh, system and tool to define our relationship with ourselves in the outside world. I mean, that's mm. unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, beyond. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really, really a gift. And, you know, there's meditation in a lot of cultures. And, you know, having been a meditation teacher myself, I, you know, connect to it really deeply. But one of the cultures, and I just went on this fascination sort of curiosity trip and looking into all the different cultures and all the different types of meditations that there were. And for, for the life of me, I couldn't find a meditation in Africa. And I started speaking to some people that were experts in the space. And they said they didn't need it. They had drumming. And I was mm -hmm. like, ah. And then that really connected me to like rhythm, presence, and kind of, mm -hmm. you know, what was going on with rhythm. Um, and I love mm -hmm. the way you've described what melody does for us, what rhythm does for us, and what, you know, harmony, really interesting that, you know, it's more of a Western thing and less of an, inter uh, an Eastern thing. It's more about interrelationship. That's beautiful. Tell me a little bit about, seems like you've been on many adventures <laughs> and the music's taken you many places. <laughs> We're talking. <Who> said <laughs> that? <laughs> you said that. <laughs> um, but on one of your adventures, if we can dive in a little bit to, you know, rewind back to, gosh, 1999 now. Um, yeah. And, yeah, what were you doing in Ethiopia um, where this track that is the intro to the Inspired Evolution now, thank you so much for your blessings um, and the community that from which it came from, man, so much love to them. What were you doing over there? What, what called you over to Ethiopia? <laughs> Okay, so, so the context uh, was this. I'd been working in the 90s as a session guitarist in the pop world, um, mm. soul pop music, working with a singer, primarily uh, with a singer called Gabrielle, touring, television, shows, radios, recording, you know, the whole pop thing, which was yeah. a, sort of a, a childhood ambition of mine. And uh, what do they say? I think John Lennon's quote, um, life swaps, ha what happens to you whilst you're busy planning everything else. Yeah. You know, that, that story was playing out, but other things were coming through and it was the beginnings, I guess, of a spiritual awareness because I was finding increasingly that I wasn't satisfied. I wasn't mm -hmm. being fed by that experience. I had, you know, the nice apartments in Primrose Hill in London. I was uh, in the public eye. I was getting on the surface a lot of respect and recognition from people for being a part of it what is essentially a, a commercial art project mm. you know that's what pop music is it's commercial art really mm. and um it satisfies many things on many levels because it's music but also what i was finding was that i came home feeling empty from the tours and i came back from one particular 36 hour round trip to new york i got a call at 11 o'clock at night saying we have a tv show to do tomorrow morning tomorrow afternoon in new york um a, a car will pick you up at six in the morning. You're on a plane. And, you know, I did this ridiculous turnaround mm. uh, and it left me feeling drained and really exhausted and questioning what I was doing and why I was doing it. And at the same time, I, was, I had been in contact with a, uh, uh, a director called Richard Duplock, who was uh, someone that my brother, who was an editor, film editor mm. and television editor, had been working with, uh, making actually equestrian videos at the time they were making show show jumping videos you know mm. these sell through videos and uh, not a world i was connected 
to or interest in at all. But Richard had been offered the opportunity to go on the back of Live Aid, uh, the mm. culture of Live Aid and the aid channels that had opened up with Ethiopia as a result, mm. and the various aid and charity organizations working over there, to go over to Ethiopia, to Addis Ababa, and to make a film uh, which was to help slow down and hopefully prevent uh, a, a massive um, migratory problem with young people in particular drifting from the, the, uh, the rural farmlands into the cities to try and find work. And what mm. it was doing was, I mean, it, it were, again, it worked on several levels. There were uh, young, young people from families who were being sent by their families to go and earn money in the cities. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of orphans from the, I think it was the Eritrean war, Mm -hmm. um, and there were orphans from the famine. And so an, uh, there was a huge bloom in the numbers of street children in Addis Ababa. And what they wanted to do was make a film that could go out to uh, charity organizations and community leaders, Ethiopian community leaders, to highlight the reasons why we needed to stop this happening. Um, that it was increasing the chances of these young people and children uh, reaching uh, an, an untimely, death fate, um, there was high death rates for orphans in, in the streets of, of Addis. Mm. Um, it was a very sad story and it was like mm -hmm. the second wave tragedy on the back of the famine. Right. So Richard contacted me and said, we have no budget, but would you like to go and have an experience in Ethiopia? And I, of course I would, you know, and mm. bear in mind it coincided with the sense of spiritual vacuum that was occurring in the pop world. So this right. felt like medicine to me. Yeah, it was an opportunity to experience and be a part of a project that wasn't about money, that wasn't about fame, that wasn't about ambition or career. It was simply somebody saying, come and help. Can you help? Mm. Um, you'll see something that you haven't seen before. You'll experience something for the first time that's new and different and may actually be very challenging for you. Maybe that's a good thing. And Richard sold it to me superbly. <laughs> and so off we went and it was it was very sudden you know it was very short notice this is uh, many of my experiences and adventures in life have been like this where suddenly i find myself in, in another situation another world we went over there and we had very little re resources i i borrowed some equipment for location recording i'd had a little bit of experience of that kind of recording um, we had a local contact called Alamayu, and Alamayu was, I think, a professor at the local university. He knew a lot of the musicians uh, mm. who were playing Ethiopian folk and traditional music around the city in little mud hut coffee houses. And uh, they would burn frankincense on the fires in these mud huts. So these places were beautifully aromatic. They drink coffee. And uh, Ethiopian coffee, you know, very popular, very, very I strong. I can imagine. <laughs> it's yeah, made its way yeah. all around the world. Yeah, I, go. <laughs> I actually had a cup this morning to, to one of these conversations. So I'm oh. a bit fuzzy. Um, <laughs> the, the, these, these places were really special. We'd go into them and listen to these musicians. And Alamai would sit there and introduce me to these musicians and say, you know, make the music for this film. Mm. Um, can you work with him, Matt? Can you work with these people? And of course, the answer was always yes. It was it, the question was how? How do we do this? You know, mm. I just had a, a stereo DAT recorder and a couple of microphones, and it's like, how do I, um, how do I satisfy the brief? And the brief was this: to make a hybrid soundtrack, hybrid as in they wanted to use traditional music, but they wanted to create it, create a soundtrack that had a more Western style of sort of film or documentary soundtrack and sure. uh, had additional elements in it. And so what we ended up doing was creating an ad hoc studio in a little villa by piling mattresses up around the walls to deaden the sound and create a controlled yeah. environment, which uh -huh. in 35 degrees C was quite a, a, a challenge. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like recording the sauna. You know? uh, 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 and uh. Um, invite the musicians to come over and I, I would get them to perform the songs that they performed to me in. And, and the little uh, uh, coffee ceremony mutts mm. um, in the other environment. And then I would record them a number of different ways. First of all, as an ensemble, so they all sang together as per usual. Then I'd get the, the masinko, which is like an Ethiopian violin. Um, yeah. I'd get the masinko player to, to play his part in isolation, which they all found very challenging, you know. I mean, <laughs> and you can understand why they, they, 
they only associated their music as an ensemble experience and i was mm. trying to separate the community, parts out in order to control them yeah it's yeah, a big part yeah. of living isn't and it and i was dismantling that <laughs> um, so with your western way, ways god damn it exactly his imperial uh, agenda and, um, and then the same with the calls, and we had to, we had to work quite hard to get to get them to to understand that we were going to make something, you know, I had to explain why and how we we're going to do this yeah. through translators. And um, fortunately, we got some fantastic recordings uh, of the instruments and the vocals. And then I took these recordings back, uh, back to England and started to work with brushes of the footage from the documentary. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just say a little bit about the documentary because it's, it's very important that the process they went through and how they came about it. So what they did was they interviewed, I don't know how many, but probably 40 or 50 young children uh, who had stories to tell. And most of them were very tragic stories. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and I won't go into the detail of them, but, you know, basically involving loss and death and uh, atrocity in one form or another. And they made a hybrid story out of these different stories and created um, uh, a, a, a hero's journey for want of a better expression, although mm. you know, I, I, applying the word heroic is actually an understatement to what some of the children went through, uh, to, to give a, a narrative structure. And so they told this one story of a young, a young boy who leaves his farmlands, um, coerced by his family, believing that he, he was young enough and strong enough to help that he goes into the city he ends up with a, a, a gang of street kids and they, they're using various drugs to keep going to keep warm mm. um and these are all true stories they're living in rail, railroad carts um they become part of, of thieving gangs uh very sad stories you know and um the the interventions that come as a result of people recognizing what's happening and, and helping to get them back on on the right path of life and and give them some healthy structures to their existence um i mean there it's a cautionary tale this is what will happen to you if you if you leave the safety of community and home in the false belief mm. that there is something better on the other side of the hill mm -hmm. on the other side of the road and um you know there is a redemption at the end of the story uh he he's delivered back to his family and he reflects uh on the journey that he's had and the importance of the message of the film so i started putting these these traditional songs uh to the footage and then weaving in a more western uh backing track around the song so mm -hmm. it became like a hybrid a hybrid soundtrack and one of them became known as sweet as rain that was my mm -hmm. rendition of it now between me finishing that job as a soundtrack and then creating Sweet as Rain, which is effectively a remix of one mm. of those songs, mm -hmm. I lost touch with all the people involved with it. When I, when I, so I, I've moved out of London, I was living in Brighton, this was five, six, yeah, about five years later. And uh, I was invited to meet a, um, a South African musician called Pops Mohammed, who was a friend of a friend. Mm. Uh, Pops was very well known in, in, in his corner of world music influence, mm. uh, you know, South African influence world music, and a lovely man. And um, I'd actually met him in Johannesburg. Um, actually, after the recording, I met him. I went over to Je Joburg and met him over there but he he came down to my flat in brighton and i played him some of the recordings of these ethiopian songs and i said can it work at combining a south african musician with ethiopian uh, traditional mm. music and he said of course it can it has spirit i love it yeah so it I does have spirit. <laughs> it, it has amazing spirit. i put um, i put a guitar part down against this traditional piece uh, he played some percussion rhythm on it. Um, he went back to, to South Africa. I, I left it for a few days. Quite often I leave a piece of music to sort of cook, you know, to <laughs> marinate yeah. and then come back to it and get some perspective on it. And, uh, and then completed it and um, put it out as a, as, a, as a remix with, I think initially a, a, a Swedish label whose name escaped me right now. Uh, and then eventually remixed it again and it came out on my last album a year and a half ago. Um, yeah so background on 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 the musicians involved very very important because in losing contact with the production companies uh, and their contacts in ethiopia 
it became really hard for me to find musicians that were used in the recordings. There was no email contact for them. You know, these guys are living very, very simple lives. Mm-hmm. Um, I contacted the executive director of the executive producer of the film, uh, Andrew Coggins, MBE, uh, who'd been heavily involved in, in both Live Aid and then the, the subsequent wave of, of charitable activities in Ethiopia. He couldn't put me in contact with anyone to try and get the names of these musicians. It was very strange. It seemed unusual that, that um, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't connect, make contact. Connect that up, yeah. Couldn't re- reconnect, yeah. Mm. And I thought this was wrong. So I contacted the director, Richard Duplock, and said, look, I'm trying to contact these people. I'm releasing this record. I'm using their vocal performances. I know the songs are traditional, but I'm using their vocal performances. I, I want to I send them they know, some of the money that comes yeah. back. They, they need to be honoured in name, but they also should be sent some money, you know, you know a, a few quid that I make on these records, because they don't sell huge numbers. But it goes an awful lot of that. So please, can you help me find them so I can send them a, a contribution? Uh, couldn't get in contact. Can you please put me in contact with Alamayu, the man on the ground in, in Addis, Ad- Addis Ababa? He's disappeared. And this went on for about two, three years. Mm. Brick wall after brick mm. wall after dead end after dead end, to the point at which I, I gave up. I just stopped thinking about it because it was, you know, it seemed to be an unsolvable mystery. Mm-hmm. Fast forward to living in Melbourne in 2000 and... 11 I think it was maybe 12 and uh, a friend that I met through the community household um, in Thornbury where I was living was involved in a in a water charity and was trying to raise some money for a, a sponsored event that she was doing and the water charity was directly connected to Ethiopia they were trying to help with water shortages there and it resonated with me and I suddenly felt um, I felt a little bit guilty and I felt very responsible. I'd earned a little bit of money from royalties from this this song. I'd never managed to find the musicians to one of them and to to give them a little bit of money uh, from the royalties that were generated by the the record. So, uh, and we're talking small amounts, you know, we're talking sort of 500 quid, um, 600 quid generated in in sales over over a few years. So, I decided to make a donation. I calculated how much money being made by the records. I worked out what would be the usual performance royalty to give to them. And I sent this money to the, the water charity mm. uh, and, and felt, I felt a sense of relief. It was a very strange <laughs> experience to go through. I genuinely felt very guilty, you know, about not being mm. able to honor and complete the, the, the cycle. So this felt like something that, that actually meant I was energetically engaged with the source of this music in a way that was sustainable. Mm. About sustainability, cultural sustainability, <laughs> rather than cultural mm. production. Yeah. And that. that's gone on ever since. You know, every time I make a little bit of money from, from uh, um, the remix, um, from the album sales that has that track on it, et cetera, et cetera, I send a small portion over. And, and here we have a situation coming around again, which is how we've managed to connect and the opportunity to tell this story where you've kindly offered to donate some money, you know, uh, for, the, for the use of this piece of music uh, to the water charity. Mm. Um, I'm still trying to find these people. Yeah. You know, I still put <laughs> the word out every now and again, maybe someone can help. Uh, at some yeah. point, someone who has connections in Addis Ababa. Um, in the meantime, let's keep on supporting the, the, the charity that's helping to bring water to, um, to parts of Ethiopia. Absolutely. And so in there, one of the things that I went away and did for homework was found out that we have 14 listeners in Ethiopia if, <laughs> at the time of this recording. Amazing. I know it's not, I know it's not a whole bunch <laughs> in Ethiopia. Um, generally, the listener base is where I've travelled to and given talks, and we haven't given any talks in Africa as of yet. Um, but that's still amazing to feel that there potentially may be someone tuning into this podcast um, yeah. that may know a little something about a little something. Or if not, you know, down the track, I'm sure the audience base will continue to grow. And if there is that yeah. spark we'd love for you to get in touch with us matt and i are totally connected now um yeah and just to yeah it'd be awesome to sort of bring the story full circle for those that are tuning Absolutely. in obviously there's a snippet in the intro and the outro that we now use as the kind of theme uh, anthem to the inspired evolution and it's an absolute honor like like matt said there's so much spirit in it and um i will play if it's okay with matt like i will, I will put a put a little, um, like the whole song at the end of this episode, yeah. just for you guys to just enjoy and tune in and really feel into to what's going on in there. Um, but man, like I love, uh, I love just 
yeah, just how much connection and reconnection there is in that story in terms of people being disconnected from, you know, their roots, their community, and being sent off into the cities to look for something bigger and brighter, and then ultimately finding out that that's not the solution. And then you, you know, being disconnected from kind of what you felt was really, really like wholesome in terms of music and the creativity, mm. like that was passionate to you, and then connecting into that for a moment, and then you know, coming back and then producing these gorgeous bits. And, you know, for me, my highest value is connection. And I don't know, some part of me really feels the energy of what you're saying. And potentially that's where the link is in this in this mm. sound because the Inspired Evolution is dedicated to people living the life that they love. And ultimately I feel like a lot of what society packs onto us um, is not the direction that is soul-serving <laughs> for each of us, right? It's it's capitalistic serving, <laughs> which, you know, for many people that's fine, but for many others it's not, um, which can be quite, quite the challenge to sort of wade your way through. Um, and I feel like, yeah, just so much a potential for connection and reconnection back to spirit, back to the natural order of things and back to nature. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that this, yeah, this audio and you found your way to connect back by connecting back to the waterways, you know, we'll definitely put a link um, to the water charity um, in the show notes below as well. And if you feel so Excellent. cold Excellent. and you're enjoying the music, please leave a donation. I know we mean the world to Matt um, and to us here at the Inspired Evolution, just to sort of give back in, in this way, man. I, I really, really like, I'm, I'm like, all my fingers and toes are crossed. I'm hoping that we can uh, <laughs> connect back to the original artist, but music's not the only thing that you're up to. Um, what else is going on? Cause you're in the Greek islands now. <laughs> oh, look, I, I seem to have made choices in my life uh, to be able to have stories to tell. You yeah. know, it's like when I look back at <laughs> me, I mean, I, and to be honest, sometimes it, it's felt like they weren't my decisions, you know, you carried. <laughs> carried um but those make the best you know. stories are <laughs> well they do you know? and, and maybe i roll maybe i roll the dice uh, in my existence by saying to myself you know the journey is more important the destination i don't know where this is going i'm gonna i'm gonna go with it um in a nutshell i got covid last year i got very sick i when i was touring with john we played in um LA and New York and I think it was on the way back from LA uh, that I picked up COVID almost definitely either at LAX or Heathrow Airport because mm. these places are just traffic and incubator so zone yeah yeah and I got very very sick and fortunately at the time I was living at my sister's house temporarily and she's a nurse and so she I mean really she saved my life because um doctors and hospitals at that particular time at the outbreak was ex extremely hard. And if you didn't have someone who knew what they were doing around you, those delays of a few days could, could cost a life. Mean everything. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, COVID took my uncle's life and he was already very sick, but he represented one of a huge number of people who really weren't served by the system that we have in the UK. Uh, we weren't prepared as a nation for how COVID hit. Um, and there is accountability to, to do with that. I won't get political about this, but the warnings were there already. The warnings had been there two years before mm. uh, by, by medical institutions that we needed to, to change our system in order to, uh, to be prepared for a pandemic and uh, it, it played out. So I've been sick. Uh, I had a year where I, I not a year, but the, the better part of a year where I was in convalescence. It took a long, long time to recover and get my energy back. Um, this thing saps the life out of you. And um, I've been generally a pretty physical fit person uh, in my life. And uh, it was a shock how hard this hit. But a number of things came out of this. First of all, um, my medicine was to walk very slowly up to some lakes near the house and sit and meditate every morning and listen to the sounds of nature and really tune into the rhythms of nature. And uh, uh, I, I had a, a moment, I guess, which would have been an epiphany where I realized that my connection to nature had somehow been lessened. Um, mm. It hadn't been broken, but, it, but I really needed to reconnect. And, and so it, it, it started asking me what my priorities were, what should I be doing? What are the things that matter to me? And it reminded me that whilst I've been touring with Janavi and playing this beautiful mantra music, I, I also have my own journey to, to do with music. And I really, really needed to get back on my own path. 
Um, and as a result of those meditations, eventually decided to step away. I mean, health issues also meant that it really wasn't practical for me to continue working. Plus lockdown meant there were no gigs. So it felt like the, the right moment to step away and reconnect with my own path. Uh, although I didn't quite know what that was going to be. I'd already made music that, ex that explored the idea of um, music as a healing and meditation tool rather mm. than music for entertainment. And uh, I, I, I'm still on that journey. That's been a, a big strand in my life. And mm. um, I want to reconnect with that in a big way. I've made an album called Music for a Busy Head. Um, uh, <laughs> shortly after the Ethiopian experience, you know, I mean, that's that's not it's not not an accident that after that I then went really dived in deep with learning um, on my own journey, you know, not through any sort of structured mm -hmm. learning, but just following my nose, how music historically has been used as a as a healing and medit meditative tool, and so I went down that path, and. Um, here I was 20 years later coming full circle, wanting to reconnect with that path. So these meditations at the lakeside in, in my convalescence uh, helped me to redirect. They also made me recognize the power of the imagination because I, I used visualizations to mobilize my immune system. Now, this is going to sound a bit wacky, but it's mm. I, I'm absolutely convinced that this helped with, with my recovery. I visualized every morning uh, a huge stadium in my head in which I was giving a speech to my immune system and my immune system was a uh, hundred thousand antibodies appearing Strong. as little people in, yeah. in the stadium and I stood there like some crazy political leader you know and I <laughs> implored them to rally their forces and their, and their energy and to and then I really um tried to inspire them. I told them how much I loved them and how much I, I, I was so appreciative of everything that they'd done for me. And, and I implored them to leave the stadium and to run to the, through the avenues of my body and to find the places where this disease was affecting mm. me and to bring about the healing. And, and so I'd have, and I, I'd finished these visualizations laughing because it was like a cartoon world. But I swear, I swear that that was a turning point because what preceded that was a moment where I was so sick in bed, I'd, I'd had this fever and uh, I, my legs weren't strong enough to, to, to stand on. I couldn't walk up and down the stairs of the house. I was in bed. The bed sheets were drenched every single night. I was losing weight very rapidly. But what I was also losing was will. And um, mm. I, I have a 24 hour period where I was terrified. I actually experienced, I remember feeling I'm, I'm so scared. I think I'm going to die. And, uh, you know, your chest is becoming more and more constricted. It's like being slowly suffocated. And um, I had this moment where a thought came into my head, a very clear thought. And it, it's a thought that has appeared at different points in my life. And the thought was this, it's a choice. You have a choice, you can decide. You can decide how you want this to go, make the choice. So I said, right, I'm going to decide to get better. And then these visualizations came out the back of that and, and, um, and I began this process of recovery. And then fast forward a little bit further into the year, heading towards October, it looks like we're about to go into a second lockdown in the country. I'm very unhappy with the politics of the country and Brexit, Britain was pulling away from Europe. I felt European, I loved and love the cultural richness that Europe has offered and, and Britain being a part of Europe has given us. And I felt that the country was going in a direction that was different to my own. And that, um, you know, the country was absolutely divided on this 48 to 52% mm. according to polls. And I just thought, who makes a political decision based on a, a, a device? Yeah, something that vote? touch and go. <laughs> like... how, how can you possibly get anything other than a divided country if you decide that that's the basis for a policy? I just thought this is so wrong. And a friend of mine, Pete Lawrence, who um, actually had dinner with him last night, he's just come back from the UK to the island of Paros, where we are. Mm. He uh, has had a house in Paros for a number of years. He's a promoter. Uh, he used to run a festival called the Big Chill Festival, which is very successful, and he was a fan of my music. So we already had a connection, and we'd been in contact about various other projects. And um, actually, I've been doing a bit of ad hoc coaching with him. And he um, said, "Look, I'm leaving the country. I'm, I've had it with England. <laughs> I really don't want to. I don't want to be in a second lockdown in the middle of an English winter. Um, I'm going to my house in Paros." Uh, why don't you come over? You can hang out there whilst you find somewhere to live. I think you'd like it here. 
And then he said about trying to find me accommodation over there, these various rental offers and being yeah. in lockdown or towards lockdown, people wanted to rent the properties. So um, I made a very sudden, very quick decision to leave the country and off I went. Um, so there were two primary surface motivations, which were uh, the politics of the country, the desire to be European and recovery from COVID. I needed to be somewhere warm. Vitamin D is vital in COVID mm. recovery. Uh, and prevention right, and right. we don't get a lot of it in the uk you know we've got mm. a sunshine country um, yep. paros or in Island's lockdown for that matter <laughs> when you... well there we go yeah. you know, it's like I, I can't be doing with this 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 yeah. is actually i felt i felt threatened by the scenario i needed to, to move in order to survive mm. so off i went and um and i've been here since but sitting behind that was also an interest in and this is a very interesting juncture for me mm. Uh, an interest in the fact that Greece, Greek ancient culture has a very powerful connection to the world of healing music through uh, uh, Pythagoras, Pythagoras. Um, his understanding of harmony, harmonics, and the ratio of sound mm. are at, absolutely central to the Western use of harmony as a healing tool. Now, Greece being where it is, is sort of on the east-west divide and has, has always had a, a um, I guess, as a crude summary, a beg, steal and borrow relationship with Eastern mysticism. Mm. You know, a lot of things that are attributed to, to being part of Greek culture, and this is this is coming from Greek people that I've spoken to very recently, you know, mm. who owns what culturally? Where does it yeah. all come from? <laughs> how, do, how do we say where it comes from? Good luck from? with that. So, Good luck with that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a you lot know, of... You know, Silk Road is a long road. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Great choice of words. Great choice of words. You know, so so um, I came here to see if I could learn more about the Greek origins. And what I found out has been phenomenal uh, in terms of Greece's relationship with mystery and the transformation of consciousness. Um, you know, above and beyond just music, music has been the gateway to a, to a, a cultural learning that is ongoing for me about um, what is essentially the cornerstone of civilization in the modern era, modern being two to three thousand years. Yeah. Um, in, in European culture. And the reason it was a, a, a junction and a crossroads for me was because I'd always looked East for wisdom, mm. Mm. you know? Mm. And, and so in my meditations, it's like, I'm European. I can't deny that. You know, I can do the DNA trick and find out that we all come from somewhere. <laughs> Maybe I came from Ethiopia, who yeah. knows? You know, I can, I can do that game. Or I can say, what in my lifetime have I experienced? And this connection to George Harrison had turned me east. You know, mm. he brought, he became the bridge and brought this spiritual connection from the east. And I've been engaging chiefly since I moved to Melbourne, my five years in Melbourne, mm. with uh, yoga practice. I got involved in Kirtan and Mantra. And, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd gone down that pathway, but coming back to Europe, coming back to England in 2017, um, at, a, at a, another crossroads for, for personal reasons I'm going to do now, but it, it left me at this point where it's like, well, where are my spiritual cultural roots? Mm. How far back do you go? Which can be is it really? Yeah, a pretty a pretty useful thing to connect into, right? Like just self identity and just really really connecting back to what it is that is your your heritage, your lineage, like mm. kind of what do you really identify with and. As global citizens, we can identify to the whole world. Um, but there's something grounding that really comes from just going, okay, the, the, the part of the story that is bigger than me, that is just me, like my my parents, their parents, like where, what is this story that's being written, you know, and trying yeah. to really connect into that. Yeah. And so I find it really amazing, Matt, what you're alluding to in that, yeah, just coming home from like this bridge between the East and the West and how that's been a major influence in your life. And yeah. right now you're kind of playing that out in your own life now. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating because, you know, the experience with COVID led to some, some, some deep meditation and processing and a realization that um, I'd always looked East for spiritual wisdom and yet I'm European you know, mm. my cultural roots are European in this life. Mm. Uh, you know, if, if, if we want to keep things grounded and focused in the present, mm. then why, why am I looking East? Why have we looked East? I'd, I'd seen it as really important. I'd followed this path. I'd got into yoga. I'd got into mantra. 
Uh, I got into Kyoto in a huge way. And yet COVID gave me this opportunity to ask myself, am I missing something? And so when the opportunity to move to Greece, which came about very, very quickly, came up for me, um, part of my, you know, this super highway of decision making that was going on, thought, decision, thought, decision, thought, decision, I'm going. Um, amongst it was how interesting ancient Greece's influence on European culture on all levels mm. has been. And how have I missed this? I didn't, it wasn't part of my school, my school education. You know, I, I didn't study Latin or, or classics or any aspect of Greek history, ancient Greece uh, as part of my education. It wasn't on my curriculum. Mm. So um, to me, that's a, a huge omission, a huge error in my education mm. that it wasn't there because it's influenced everything in the modern era of European culture, politics, society, um, our education systems, medicine, for goodness sake, the Greek influence on medicine is phenomenal. And the intersection between health, medicine and music goes right back to this, this point in time with ancient uh, Greece uh, around about 6th century BC and the mystery schools associated with the Pythagor Pythagorean era. Mm. Um, so a part of my journey to come here was to look at that and to ask myself, you know, how... Um, how true is it that all roads lead to the top of the mountain? You know, <laughs> does, it, does it matter which faith I dip into? Mm. Is it a problem that I see myself as a spiritual tourist? A lot of people think that's a very bad thing because it's ungrounded, not having a regular practice to come back to. Mm. Well, I do. Or, or, you know, I borrow bits of my practice from, from hither and thither. Mm. Um, what, what I've been given is what sticks. You know, mm. the, the teachers that have given me things in other words, it wasn't my will that drew me into certain lessons. I've been given a mantra by a Vedic priest, which helped me through a very, very difficult period of my life. Uh, and, uh, and I use that um, sparingly. I have a morning practice, which comes from the Sat Satyananda tradition. And mm. I spent time at an ashram in New Zealand after a friend of mine died and I needed solace. Mm. And, um, uh, and now I'm exploring this this Greek avenue, which mm, 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 isn't mm. so much about faith, but it's about experience mm -hmm. and uh, a checking in of reality. So, you know, I'm I'm right at this junction now. I've, I'm sitting next to you. Can't see it. I wonder if I can just. And I'll I'll, I'll give you a snapshot later that you can mm -hmm. cut in. I've got a, a huge drape with Ganesh hanging behind <laughs> my screen here in the studio. You know, and I and I. Yeah. I allude to the idea that if I've got creative blocks, then Ganesh may help me to identify <laughs> my man. <laughs> how, how am I? How am I stopping myself? You know, what am I doing to obstruct my own flow? So yeah. I use these icons. I use these images. I, I use these. I which, see them as metaphors, which is know. pretty beautiful, isn't it? Like the day and age that we live in, and I've often reflected on this. It's like we've got a little bit of yoga from India, um, you know, and I can take little bits of like herbalism from China, um, you know, and I can take some, you know you know, just the, the cultural, we were talking about drumming from Africa. Like I can, like in, mm. it just seems like in 2021, like we're just able to, to craft our own spirituality in many ways, you know, and I know that there is like what you're alluding to, which is, you know, there are tried and tested pillars and faith, which people have paid like so much homage to, um, which is definitely, you know, hats off to all of that. And I think what's happened is these pillars exist to such a profound level that actually like, a platform is being built and maybe that's the way forward on all these pillars saying that actually we are all saying the same things, you know, and that potentially I can take a little bit of here and a little bit from there just so it enriches my life because that's more accessible with some regard and that's more accessible to some regard. Um, yeah. I just find it fascinating just the day and time we live in and just the access we have to information, how much richer our spiritual lives can be. Um, thanks to that. Like even just, I wake up, I meditate, a particular way. Um, and then I've got, you know, I go for a walk, which is just very stock standard sort of, you know, but it is part of my spiritual practice of like hanging out with my dog and just going mm -hmm. out for a walk. And then a, like, you know, a smoothie made with like, you know, shaga, cordyceps, reishi, like these are all 
Chinese things. <laughs> Why is this Indian yeah. bloke doing eating all this stuff? You know, let alone yeah. this Australian bloke eating all this stuff. You know, I was like, what is yeah, going on yeah. here? <laughs> and then a uh, little bit of yin yoga in the evening, and then learning to play Brazilian music on the guitar, which you know for them yeah. is a whole spiritual expression unto itself. Absolutely. And it's yeah. like, where is you know? And it's it's just so rich. It's just so rich. The opportunity. Well, you know, it's spiritual diversity, isn't it? And, and it's and it's cultural diversity as well. And it's unavoidable if you've got a, a Wi-Fi connection. If you've got the <laughs> internet, then you have access access to information in a way that has never been experienced before. So we can't say, um, well, we can, but I think it's challengeable to say that you should have a faith that's grounded in one system and, and, and that is your anchor. I can mm. see how it's advantageous to a lot of people. And I had this discussion uh, with, with a Vedic priest about you know, the, the very nature of what it is to be a spiritual tourist. But then the other side of that is those of us that didn't grow up with a faith mm. or grew up at a time when the prescribed faith, which in my case was Church of England, Sunday school, morning assembly at school, mm. it really, what did it represent? It represented a, a very simple, and I'm not saying there was anything bad about it. I used to love singing hymns in the morning, mm. but I didn't necessarily identify with the Christian mythology uh, n n perhaps that was a failing of the way it was taught because I'm actually working on a project at the moment which uh, has a background of Franciscan um, spirituality mm. and I really identify with it and I, I identify with the values that St Francis uh, brought to the world and promoted and, and actually he was he was a reformer in, in mm. many ways so so I, I've come full circle in, in that I, I have a much greater capacity to embody aspects of, of faith that I previously was very cynical about as a result of having explored other ones. So I think this spiritual diversity makes us open to experience and open to the ability to interpret the metaphor of spiritual mythologies. And I think it's really important that we have that capacity because if we don't we're in danger of tiptoeing towards a sense of dogma mm. and the, 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 the dogmatic path of any situation, including science. You know, the dogma of science is as dangerous as any faith dogma, as any educational dogma. Um, we need a, a broad understanding of the world that we see. We need multiple perspectives. I think two, two of the most important lessons that I've had in the last few years have come from a, um, an artist writer philosopher called Nora Bateson and she promotes the idea of warm data as opposed to cold hard data this mm. idea of warm data um, and, and interwoven into this idea of warm data which is you know conversational it's it's community based is the notion of promoting context and community as mm. the two foundation pillars through which we can experience life in a more meaningful way mm. context because we need multiple contexts Mm -hmm. We need to understand many faiths. We need to understand many different views of knowledge. Mm -hmm. We need to understand many different views of ethical values. We need to understand many different views of how we can live on a day-to-day -day basis. That There isn't one way, but there are many ways that our environment, environment um, and the cultural history of that environment, you know, the human engagement with that environment will create the tradition of that area, but it isn't the same for all areas. So we, and, and then and then community because no human is an island unto himself. Uh, mm -hmm. We never needed community spirit more, and I find it really challenging because I'm a bit of a maverick and a bit of a loner. And so all of my wounds and the stuff that I've had to work on and continue to work on, and it's always coming round for me. And it's it's it will be a work in progress for the whole of my life. It involves a sense of isolation of abandonment and then the the joy of inclusivity and the, the the dropping of burden when i share my story of whatever it is that i'm mm. experiencing life with other people and and it, the, the energy becomes dissipated and one merges with one community in the same way that one needs to merge with one in one's environment so we need context um, and we need community and you've got those two pillars you can pretty much go anywhere you know in terms of your consciousness i find it remarkable and one of my favorite quotes um is <laughs> some this guy comes up to and those listening to the podcast you've heard me say this before but i wanted to share it with you <laughs> and you might maybe you've heard it before um guy asked the dalai lama he goes how important is community to um one's own spiritual enlightenment journey and the dalai lama responded not at all important 
Wow. It's everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it just like the more podcasts I have, like well, here we are talking about music and the effect that it has on the world. And, you know, I'm talking about like talking to business CEOs. It just, I, it makes a lot of sense in every conversation when it comes up. <laughs> it's like, oh, community. Yes. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. but then you look at the, the, the diaspora of just how many different, I don't want to call them ailments, but avenues, let's call them avenues. All these different avenues are all seeking um, a community as a solution to kind of what's currently ailing them in many ways, you know, even Mm. just the way communication, you know, around the world is breaking down and our relationship with each other. And it just seems like community, 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 again, is just this central thing. And I feel like it was, it's an, it's, it's innate to who we are as an, as, as a species. And I think, Mm. you know, somehow, I don't know if it's to blame screens or if it's to blame the way the world's set up. I have no idea who to blame, but, and maybe it's not worth blaming anybody or anything, but I real I can feel that there's this massive call to community um, through everything that we're doing, um, mm-hmm. whether it's for business, whether it's for song, whether it's for food, you know, just even growing our own food locally. Mm-hmm. Um, it's so many different avenues, like getting together around like waste management solutions and stuff like that, all these different problems that we have. And it's like if we just could band together and identify as a community and provide community-based mm-hmm. solutions, um, so much would change. And one of the things that I often reflect upon is, you know, just how intrinsic, um, well, I'm a bit of a foodie, so <laughs> food is to culture, but then also how important music is to culture and how mm. much culture shapes community. You know, it's this, this thing and how much music is woven into the building of community and culture. Like, as you mentioned, like George Harrison, like the community that was pulled together by the music must be so inspirational for, for yourself. Well, it's a massive topic, isn't it? Um, how do we how do we begin to express the importance of music within community and, and the way it unites? I mean, first of all, let's look at is there a culture on the planet that doesn't use music? <laughs> Uh, and and then let's look at the origins of how music. Even the whales used. do, bro. <laughs> there we go. There we go. And here's here's something interesting I learned learned about whales the other day from a, a marine biologist. Um, whales evolved out of the sea onto Earth and then returned back to the sea. Now, what did they know? Oh. They've had a double evolution. They've they've had a they did a return journey from the land back into the sea. So wow. they uh, it, it it implies a certain wisdom, a certain knowledge, a certain knowing. Um, That's and gorgeous. Perhaps <laughs> the songs between whales is. Uh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a link to put up on on your your show to Please. to a friend of mine who's uh, who's doing some great work with whale songs. She's a marine biologist and she's. Um, She's doing good stuff. Anyway, sorry, I digressed music. you. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's good. I mean, this is this is the nature. Of the, the the river meanders, doesn't it? It's mm. not. Uh, what are they? The saying the Japanese garden straight lines are the work of the devil. Everything <laughs> curves. Just everything bends. You know, and you follow the follow the flow of nature. Everything's circular. Mm. So music has been used uh, as a tool to create congregation, a sense of congregation. Mm. It it calls people together. It imitates the, the the sounds and the songs of nature around us. Bird song. I, I firmly believe that the evolution of language uh, is intertwined with a response to the calls of the wilds of, of bird song in particular. Um, if you read uh, the Master and His Emissary by Ian McGilchrist, which is an astonishing book, I've only actually tapped into it in little bits and pieces, but I've uh, seen bits of his work in interview form as well, and um, he posits in one of his chapters that uh, the first forms of language were actually song, not mm. uh, not speech. We were singing before we were speaking. And the idea being that um, the most important form of communication in, in human origin would have been an emotive call to a, to a dangerous situation. You know, basically mm. we're trying to emotively connect about the saber-toothed tiger to use the sort of the cliched analogy that generally mm-hmm. gets brought up in these scenarios. 
Uh, how do you warn your 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 fellow about that, or how do you express or communicate the opposite of that, which is a sense of of wellness, connection, and love, uh, a, a binding energy through sound, through music? Well, it's going to be song way more than it's going to be speech. Mm. You know, when we sing, mm. we connect in the heart. I have been uh, hanging out with a, a a really sharp cookie, an, an Italian girl that I met a couple of weeks ago. And um, she sings when she talks. The Italians sing. Mm. You hear it. Portuguese is and, the same. I'm so jealous. And Southwest <laughs> Ireland, <laughs> the, 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 southern, the Southern Irish from Cork, you know, yeah. when they, they sing in triplets. Da, 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 it's all in threes. <laughs> like, wow. Lang- language contains musicality. So, so, so how important is, is music to culture? Mm. Well, it's, it's in our speech because it potentially predates our speech that we sang first. Uh, it reflects the rhythms of environment around us, um, the, ha- the, the, the howling of the wind, the, the lulling of the breeze, uh, the dawn chorus and, and, and the sunset, uh, the cicadas and, and the other insects at sunset or, or whatever sounds are local to your environment. You know, if you're in, in the Western Isles of Scotland, then it's probably a howling gale, but it's still <laughs> music, it's still sound. Who's mm-hmm. to say that the bagpipes don't sound like the howling of the wind across the, the Scottish mm-hmm. moors, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's interwoven in that way, but I, I think one of the things that that took me into the study of music as a healing tool. Um, let me paint you a picture. In the mid mid nineties, I was working. I had this dual life. I was working as a session guitarist in the pop world, which was mm. uh, well executed, s- simple, soulful pop songs uh, playing in front of big audiences at festivals and and, and in stadiums and. Um, television and radio you know it was I think as I alluded to earlier on it was you know finely crafted commercial music Mm. and it was very enjoyable I was was part of an 11 piece soul band it was it was kick-ass it was really good to be a part of Mm. Um, simultaneous to that I was making electronic dance music um, trance in fact electronic trance music psychedelic trance Mm. in fact with a small group of mavericks in the southwest of London and um, we played at a at a rave in uh, on a, an ostrich farm near Cape Town in South Africa. It's bizarre mm-hmm. set of circumstances. <laughs> Colourful, wild, crazy goa trance, psychedelia, yeah. liberation, ecstasy through uh, through expression on the dance mm. floor. And um, I remember thinking, if I can make people or assist people towards this state of liberation, and and sort of chaotic catharsis is how I saw it Mm. where else can I take them with music is there another place they can go to Mm. can I use music as a different kind of tool and and that opened this question about um, music as a healing tool and actually it was further catalyzed by a car accident on a tour in in uh, Australia Mm. uh, in 99 it all happened around the turn of the millennium for me when um, I climbed Mount Warning and uh, somebody told me if you go up Mount Warning if there's anything in your life that needs changing, it will be thrust before you in a way that you can't avoid it. And it did because oh, wow. we had a car accident a few days later on, on broken head road <laughs> of oh, all places. No. Yeah, and right. uh, the car accident put a full stop on my engagement with the trance scene and mm. opened the door to working with music as a healing tool. So I started to explore. I started to study. Mm. I wanted to understand the origins of, of humanity's engagement with music. So I went down a little bit of a, a sort of light musicology pathway, anthropology, musicology. I mean, just casual study in, in mm. spare time. I stopped touring. I stopped working as a session guitarist. I started writing music for TV because it was studio based. I started learning to be a producer, a mm. studio based producer. Technology had changed. Digital had come in in a big way. And you could now have a bedroom studio that was, you know, broadcast quality. So mm. I borrowed some money, set up a studio. What I found was that uh, common to most cultures was the use of music um, predating entertainment. That was the first revelation. Music hasn't always been about entertainment. It's Mm. been about other things. What's it been about? Um, Shamanistic congregation, Mm -hmm. bringing people together, the call, the beating of the drum, Mm. entrainment, the rhythm of the community, entrained to a rhythm uh, of a drum beat is a way of forging and um, unifying consciousness. So song, rhythm, entrains and focuses the group consciousness. From there, an important message can be delivered, a sense of 
uh, calendric um, importance can be conveyed. It's a certain time of the year. We need a certain ritual. We use music uh, to punctuate just about every human ritual that we have in mm. some form or another. Mm. So there's the there's this sudden realization that actually, you know, us doing music for entertainment, you know, dance isn't necessarily entertainment, but it's borderline. Mm. Uh, pop music is definitely entertainment, but it's mm -hmm. still about connection to an emotional quality. It's about mm -hmm. It comes down to what all artists do, which is they say, this is what I see, what do you see? An mm -hmm. artist gives us an opportunity to have a dialogue about something. And we mm -hmm. use the metaphor of, of the song of, of music. Sometimes it's a bit too literal, but you know, we use art as metaphor in order to engage and connect on stuff that is perhaps not so easy to talk about or gets lost in day-to-day -day activities. Music brings us together, unites us, gives leadership an opportunity to plant a central message or to direct the attention uh, mm. in a certain way now this is very different from um pop and and even rock and roll and i and i actually challenged th that we may be out now the age of rock and roll may be over we're now into a different paradigm uh of of creative expression especially with the digital tools that we now have so mm. My journey was really to reconnect with the, the origins of music. Um, and I found so many different examples and studies of the use of music as a healing tool uh, congregationally and also, you know, in terms of one-to-one -one practice, mm -hmm. um, what became music therapy, sound and music therapy from the very esoteric, you know, gong baths and um vibrational theory and, and resonance um, and then and then learning that a lot of these principles actually come from things like Tibetan Buddhism uh, that are sh shamanistic practices from many different cultures and there are many parallels uh, across different cultures and and then um, this one astounding piece of knowledge you talked about Chinese you know and herbalism and Taoism has fascinated me for a long time mm. um, doing a little bit of research into into music as a healing tool and finding out that I think second or third century in sort of dynastic China, there were uh, leaders, emperors, kings, I'm not sure what the correct title would have been for the, for the sort of feudal dynasties that they were ruling over, probably emperor. Um, they measured the health of a community by the quality of the music that was being expressed by that community. You know, how, how good are you singing? You're in fine form. You could say the self same, say exactly the same for Welsh communities. Mm. The tradition of, of Welsh choirs uh, is, is astonishing. You know, we, we talk about the UK and Britain, but actually when you look at Ireland, Scotland and Wales as, as separate uh, Celtic and Gaelic uh, cultures, there's an astonishing richness and, you know, English is, what is English in the middle of all? I don't know, There's a few people will probably tell me after this podcast, but <laughs> um, where am I going with this? The Chinese were uniting uh, and forming astonishing sized choirs and, and orchestras um, from anything up to 10,000 people performing at the same time together. I mean, we're talking astonishing numbers and their purpose wasn't to entertain. Their purpose was to unite the energies, the celestial energies with the energies of the ground in order to bring richness to the soil, fertility to the land and harmony to the communities. So they had a very different interpretation as to what music was. It was a gateway to harmonizing that which was on earth with that which was above, you know, as mm. above, so below very very different approach and this was second and third centuries i think um I, I'll, I'll need to reference these but you know i'm, I'm probably close <laughs> in mm. terms of dates mm. so so what we have is lots of examples of music being used in very different ways and there's me playing at uh at, at wild hedonistic raves and appearing on television playing commercial pop mm. and questioning why am i doing these things i've mm. reached these early sort of ego driven aspirations all these liberating aspirations there's nothing wrong with either of them mm. but they weren't fulfilling me they weren't <laughs> giving me what i needed and so i started to change direction and i've been on that journey ever since and the latest iteration of that journey is me sat here in uh, in a house in just outside parakia on the island of paros uh, in greece mm. beautiful Thank you so much for sharing that. One of the things um, I loved, you can tell the health of a community by the, by the health of their songs. Like that is yeah, just- Yeah, yeah, how about that? that? Is, 
<laughs> just I can't even go there with you. <laughs> One of the things prior to you dropping that, the question that was emerging for me was, um, yeah, just this this disenfranchisement that we've experienced through what has happened for the masses as song has become more entertainment than natural expression. Um, yeah. The minute where it turned around, it's like, oh, you're a good singer, you sing, I'm good. <laughs> and it's like, no, <laughs> you sing too. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, yeah. no, nah, I don't sing. It's like, what the fuck? You breathe, you talk, <laughs> like, you sing, bro. And it's like, yeah. no, nah, I yeah. don't. <laughs> it's like... What? Yeah. <laughs> and just what that does to disconnect one from song, like you said, song predates yes. language even in this conversation. So yes, yes. And what like we're talking about the health of a community and the health of their mm. song, and just what potentially it does to disenfranchise one from their sense of song and their song. Mm. Well, and and let's let's go further down that as an idea. So uh, in the UK, Britain's Got Talent. Uh, the voice, you know, these 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 massive franchise talent shows that go out on television all around the world in in various names and guises uh, are absolutely central to this disenfranchisement because they promote the idea of us uh, voting and uh, it's almost gladiatorial, isn't it, that we mm. put these people into the Colosseum and we back one or the other of them and and maybe we even ridicule and humiliate those that aren't talented and, and we buy into the idea of wanting to be surprised by someone looking geeky but being a brilliant mm. singer and that's a, that's a positive but for the most part the reason why it's disenfranchising is because it sits now at the forefront of the commercial process of selling popular culture Mm. Uh, you know, the, the, this is this is a franchise that involves record labels, publishers, television companies, management companies. It's the pop factory, mm -hmm. and they are producing product. Uh, it's got very little to do with with healthy self expression. Now, there are plenty of instances where people could say, "Yeah, but we replicated, you know, the talent shows at school for a bit of fun, and that we've created our own sort of mini culture." But it's still doing the same thing. It's basically saying, "Who's the best?" Mm. Not who's included. Mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. who who has voice not mm. what do you want to express and what do you need to say yeah. and most important of all who's listening you know what does it do to our relationship to the idea of of being heard and being listened to it sends out a message that says you only get heard if you're really good and you strut on the stage well mm. uh in terms of mental health within a community that's not a positive message to send out at all mm -hmm. now it'd be very easy for me to, to keep on going down this pathway and just bash the whole idea of commerciality which is probably what you know the conclusion you could draw already <laughs> i i've made choices i still earn a living from music and from sound it's mm -hmm. got harder uh the process for musicians has become very hard with streaming what we've seen over the years is every time we have a new format of music, so from vinyl to CD, from CD to MP3, from MP3 to streaming, each time they change the formats at an industrial level, industrial commercial level, they change the deals. It's an opportunity to renegotiate the deal and a larger piece of the pie goes upstream to the organizations and a smaller piece of the pie goes to the musicians. Mm. And, our, and our representative institutions seem to, have, seem to have been powerless to stop this from happening, the, the unions. Um, and the organizations, PRS and um, et cetera, you know, the collecting agencies, they seem to have been powerless, although there are now inquiries going on in the UK at government level and debates going on at, at government and parliament level about this. Uh, what's my point? Um, surely art is a democratic process. Surely cultural engagement is a democratic process. And most importantly, the conclusion that I've drawn about where things are heading in general, the, the, the grand narrative of our time is that we have uh, now got a scenario where the world has got used to the idea of community and society being a marketplace. That's mm. second nature. And we've got the circles drawn the wrong way. 
the marketplace lives within and is a function and a tool of society. Mm. Society is a byproduct and an interdependent component of environment. So the big circle is environment. Mm -hmm. The next big circle is society. The next one is community. And within community and society are a couple of tools called marketplace and economics. Mm -hmm. Now, we are peddled on a daily basis, the idea that the big circle is marketplace and and everything else sits inside it. That Mm -hmm. environment is a byproduct of community and society, is a resource that's there for our, our advantage. Wow, how wrong have we got it? Mm. You know, or how wrong of a certain cabal of people got it uh, for mm. their own commercial benefits so we need a re-education and sitting within all that lies cultural power connectivity the expression of self in meaningful ways the telling of story the this is what i see what do you see mm. and music is 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 the is the fluid connector of of that energy uh, uh, music is the river of culture it's the water system of culture if i could take everything you just said and the individual expression level and us getting our own empowerment all the way through to the rebalancing of those spheres and those circles it's like that is the heart of the what the inspired evolution is trying to achieve yeah (laughs) yeah there we go go. you know and it's just man it's ah, i'm just so grateful i'm just beyond grateful matt like Thank you so much, sincerely. Just this conversation, the intention, the ability to be able to carry this audio bite um, as part of the Inspired Evolution's frequency to put it out there in the world and just what it means to you, sharing it with us, what it means to us. And, um, yeah, I'm just just honoured and humbled at the same time. Um, Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Look, thank thank you for giving me a platform. You know, it's it's really nice to uh, to meet people with parallel values, (laughs) intrinsically the same values, and to be given an opportunity to to share my journey. Um, And how interesting that that it's come about. I was going to ask you actually, how did you how did you how did we connect? How did you find (laughs) that music? (laughs) That's what's happened. A A piece of music has connected us. Yeah. Yeah, which is culture, hey? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So how did I connect to your music? So I heard it in a sound file. I heard it in a mix by gen- another gentleman that I've had on the podcast called Apukuna. Um, his name is John. And he mixed your song into one of his mixes. And okay. I was in a, yeah, in a in a meditative sort of context and this track came on and just i just got up like i was meant to be sitting in meditation <laughs> and i just got up and it was just like i was animated um wow and wow. yeah there's parts to it which i probably shouldn't <laughs> i probably shouldn't say to you because it's um, appropriating culture almost but um there's the the lyrics to this song it's like i would do your man and there's like that, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. Awaji, manne, and I've got my own little remix to it when I sing along to it, which is like, yeah, how yeah. do you manage? Great yeah. spirit, don't manage. <laughs> would Because there's so much spirit in there. It's just like, great spirit, yeah. don't manage. Because the whole world is trying to manage, right? And I feel like leadership is not about management at all. It's about empowerment. Management to me is like clipping the wings and putting things in pigeonholes. And so I yeah. heard this song and I just like, it just got me, it just lit me up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> and uh, so here I am sitting there like shazamming it <laughs> and uh, found it on youtube and then i had a chat yeah. with chat with john on the podcast um yeah. and we featured some of his music and then he was like dude like you should if that if that mix speaks to you that much and that particular soundbite speaks to you that much like you should you should reach out like you know and just Brilliant. tune into pound electric and Brilliant. i was just like shit i could eh? <laughs> like, there go. and so and the rest is kind of i found you on uh, on facebook and i dropped a dropped a line and you were very forthcoming and it was like man, like, I, I don't know what to say about this, but this is where my heart goes. And the rest is kind of, here we are. <laughs> Brilliant. Look, let, let me just add a little bit of detail to the story because it's, it's very interesting. I don't know what these lyrics mean. And I've tried mm. to find out when we were doing the location recordings. So I recorded probably uh, eight or nine songs. Um, mm. They're not in Amharic. They're in a regional dialect. Mm. Um, 
and there are many regional dialects there so it, it will be a bit like finding an obscure indigenous australian mm. language so and, many tribes. You know, yeah, and yeah. the conversations that then evolve about you know interpreting the meaning so um, there's been several people along the journey that have said, this is not this, this is that, this is something else, but no one's ever given me an explanation as to what it means. And, I, and there was a moment a few years ago where uh, a colleague, Mark Francis, Mark uh, produced uh, a, a number of documentaries. Like I recently worked on him on a, a, an immersive soundscape um, from the film Walk With Me, which was Mark's journey with Thich Nhat Hanh. Mm. And... Um, Prior to that, we got together on, to make that project because prior to that, he had made a, uh, an investigative documentary about the rigging of prices in the coffee trade, mm. uh, focused on how Ethiopian farmers were being ripped off. Mm -hmm. And he'd found out through the grapevine that I had been to Ethiopia and had some recordings of traditional Ethiopian music. Could he possibly use one of these recordings in, in his film? Absolutely, you can. Um, not only that, but it generated the use of that music in the film generated some royalties, which ended up going to... Uh, the water charity so oh, it was a commercial opportunity to raise some funds for the charity uh, i made some money out of it as well it wasn't just about giving it was about mm. sustaining me too mm. um and and then there was the feedback from his film from people who were in the know saying um you know this this is not music of the particular region that you're talking about in the film you've got this wrong and we're like well we didn't know we just got this music from uh, mm. Addis Adaba, and we knew it wasn't in traditional Amharic, and, and, and we thought, we were told at the time of the recordings that the majority of these songs were songs about the land and songs in praise and thanks of the land. Mm. They were giving thanks for that. They were harvest songs. Um, one of them is a fertility rights song, and I was mm. made, made a point of making sure I knew which one that was so I didn't get it wrong. You know, but, um, <laughs> I don't actually know what the lyrics of this song mean. And, and you know, as, as much as it's been a mystery to try and reconnect with the singers mm. in the community there, it's also been a mystery as to find out what the literal translation of. I mean, you know, who knows? I might have got it completely wrong. I just spontaneously and intuitively called the track Sweet as Rain because mm. I remembered the conversations about these songs being of the land. Yeah. So if there's anyone out there who's got a, an in-depth understanding of Ethiopian dialects, please listen, tell me what we'd love to. We'd mean. love to tune in and find out more. But yeah. I, I love that it's Sweet as Rain and the, the funds go to a water charity and just the flow. <laughs> like it's yeah. just, yeah. there's just a flow around all of this. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to have to link in the whole track right after this conversation for people to tune into. Right. Um, yeah. And, and there's, and there's remixes of it as well. I, re I remixed mm. it for the last album. So it seems to have these new lives, which is, which is really nice. So you know. beautiful. So beautiful. I'll put a link to, to all your links, uh, everything you mentioned in the show notes as well, Matthew. Good Brother, idea. like, honestly. Thank you so much for doing this with us. My pleasure. Opening Thank yourself you. up, being vulnerable and sharing the story, gifting us the music, the anthem, like just every, like love you. <laughs> is all I can really say. Love you too, man. Love you too. <laughs> and uh, yeah, gratitude for this conversation that informs us here today, but also it's a lifetime's of work and just the little bits along your journey, which has just informed so much of the richness that we've got to experience today on behalf of myself the Inspired Evolution Tribe, the audience tuning in. We just want to thank you so much. And uh, on behalf of all of us, man, wishing you all the best for everything that's coming up. Thank you. My pleasure. Re really, really enjoyable talking to you. I hope we get to talk again. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave us a comment. And if you want to stay in tune for new episodes launching every Monday, hit subscribe and I'll see you in the next video. Stay inspired to evolve. Yeah,